Hear, O oh my beloved. You are the reason for the being of the world. You are the center point of the sphere and its encompassing. You are its complexity and simplicity. You are the order brought down between heaven and earth. I did not create for you realizations, except that you realize me in them. And when you realize me, you realize yourself. Do not strive to realize me in the realization of yourself. By my eye, you will see me and yourself. You will not see me by the eye of yourself. Beloved, how often have I called you and you do not hear? How often have I stood before you and you do not witness me? How often have I embodied myself in scents and you do not inhale? And in the flavors and you do not savor the taste for my sake? What is the matter with you that you do not feel me when you touch? Why do you not recognize me in the fragrances of musk? Why do you not see me? Why do you not hear me? What is the matter with you? What is the matter with you? your most heady rapture beyond any delight. My craving for you is more intense than any born for an object of desire. I am better for you than any good thing. I am the beautiful. I am the elegant. Love me. Love me. Love me alone. Desire me ardently. Be consumed in me, not engrossed in other than me. Take me in, receive me. You will not find an intimate like me. Everything wants you for itself, but I want you for your sake. But you, you avoid me. Beloved, you cannot meet me halfway in your drawing close to me. My drawing close to you outweighs a hundredfold the means by which you approach me. I am closer to you than yourself. And yourself, which performs these acts, is other than me. Created. Welcome to uh, Dr. Osama Hassan, our resident uh, guest on this show. Uh, we began with uh, a discussion of metaphysics based around uh, the writings of Ibn Arabi, uh, the great uh, 12th century thinker, mystic, uh, and an actual uh, uh, great, uh, one of the world's greatest thinkers, arguably, as well. And we discussed uh, issues. Uh, like uh, Tawheed, his perspective on Tawheed, his perspectives on uh, prophethood and the perfect man, the concept of the perfect man in the, in the last show. We also touched on uh, the significance and the relevance of uh, the discussion around mysticism, metaphysics and reason of, and philosophy uh, and its relevance to the modern era. Uh, so many issues spring forward from the discussion around uh, a great thinker such as Ibn Arabi and this program is really a qualification, a little follow-up to our previous program in terms of digging a little deeper into what the great man was 
thinking and how he was expressing things and perhaps even some uh, controversies and misinterpretations that might be out there that could be cleared up. But Dr. Zama, we finished last week's program beginning to touch on Wahdat al Wujud. Can you just first of all define uh, Arabi's concept of Wahdat al Wujud? Because it is a controversial one, especially with <coughs> orthodox ju jurisprudential circles. Yeah, it, uh, some authorities say that Ibn Arabi never used the term Wahdat al Wujud itself, but uh, that he talked around and, and about it, uh, which is quite clear uh, in his writing. It was basically to say that uh, the world is a manifestation of God uh, himself, or the reflection of, of God. And Wahdat al Wujud would mean the oneness of being or the oneness of existence. Uh, so the idea that uh, uh, creation or existence reflects the names of God, or that being, as Imam Ghazali said, or all comes from God, all flows from God, existence or being, and uh, every single created entity or being has a, a different amount of being according to its capacity. That's something actually Imam Ghazali wrote about as well in the Mishkat al Anwar, the, the niche of lights, of which there are at least two good English translations uh, available. But Ibn Arabi became associated with this idea uh, that in the end there's only oneness and, and, and the world is a manifestation of God. Now, later, Sheikh Ahmed Sir Hindi in the, in the Sunni tradition in India uh, critiqued that idea and he said that's wrong, it should be Wahdat al-Shuhud, the unity of witnessing, which is related to Fana and Baqa, which the early Sufis talked about, Fana, where you annihilate yourself, um, so you get rid of your ego and you're not aware of yourself and you're aware of only oneness. He called that the unity of witnessing, uh, Wahdat al-Shuhud. Um, because, of course, very early on there were controversial statements like Al Hallaj said, I'm the truth, you know, and Al Haq, and he was crucified for that. Um, but before that, Bistami, Abu Yazid al Bistami, who is generally revered by the, by the Sufis, uh, especially in the Sunni world, he said, Subhani ma adama sha'ni, you know, he said, Glory be to me, how great I am, which was very similar to what uh, Hallaj had said. Now, what Ahmed Sir Hindi said was, this was people who had um, annihilated their own ego, they weren't aware of anything. Uh, besides God, because they were focused on God, they were devoted worshippers of God, and that should be called uh, the unity of their witnessing, of their experience. Mm. But it doesn't, it's not the same as what is actually out there, of everything being um, equal to God in some sense. He, he said, no, out there there is God and there is the creation, which are two separate things. Uh, Shah Waliullah later came along, uh, of course, also in India, in Delhi, and he again reconciled between the two of, of them. He said Ibn Arabi was right in what he was saying, and Ahmed said Hindi was also right that uh, creation does reflect the names of God and, and God is a source of all being so there is that unity uh, around creation and existence but on the other hand in terms of humanity's practical manifestations towards spirituality uh, we have to struggle long and hard do your prayers and charity and serve people and uh, break your ego and by the grace of God you may attain that state where you, uh, you're not aware of yourself and you're only aware of God and you get to the state of Wahdat uh, al-Shuhud, unity of witnessing. Um, so you could paraphrase that perhaps Shah Waliullah was saying that Ibn Arabi was talking about how things are, following Ghazali and Bistami and others, and uh, Sheikh Ahmed said Hindi was talking about how things might appear to be to the devotee, to the worshipper, the state uh, you could be in. Mm. That's a really fascinating, a very deep concept there, and uh, again, something that probably uh, your average layperson doesn't wrestle with in his daily life. Yet it's actually very, very fundamental because we do say we're Muslims, we recite the uh, kalma and, and we assume that that's it, that makes us Muslims. And perhaps it is the case that if intellectually we're not able to go to that next level and try to understand these deeper issues, perhaps it isn't important for that sort of individual. But the danger there for me Dr. Summers, is if you don't try to understand these principles or these ideas and, and, and negate them totally, it means that you perhaps have an oversimplified perspective of Islam's depth and the knowledge that comes with the Holy Quran. So the only time it really disturbs me is if people completely ignore the fact that these arguments, these discussions, this discourse exists out there, um, whether one understands it to the depth that perhaps somebody else at a scholastic level does is a, is a different issue. 
One of the other things that perhaps concerns me is that scholasticism also, or institutional scholasticism, may be inclined towards saying, well, actually, the masses can't really cope with this. So it's be better that this isn't in the arena. Uh, ideally, just avoid it, and let's just not even disseminate or distribute these, this knowledge amongst the masses. All they need to know is their five pillars of Islam, practice those basics, don't worry about the detail. I worry about it because the Quran says re reflect. And it mm -hmm. says think, are those who think the same as those who don't. It worries me partly also because um, we're supposed to be striving for knowledge at the highest level. And if we give up thinking, if we give up dabbling in these dialogues and discourses, um, then we're kind of denying that responsibility which is placed on us as, as uh, vice students potentially. It also gives the ground to other societies who are non-monotheistic perhaps to take the lead because if they do carry on thinking and developing and we stop it has a very uh, dangerous imbalance in, ter in terms of the society and the world that we then create because we're, we're, we're not no longer involved in being part of the shaping of that or leading the way. Those are some of my reservations and there is sort of a justification of our dialogue and discourse as well for, for the viewers to say why is it important to discuss metaphysics or philosophy or the deeper aspects of Tawheed or even why is Arabic even relevant, to be honest. Sure. Yeah, I think a key point there is depth that you mentioned. Uh, and the depth we find that in the fundamental teaching of the Prophet ﷺ in the Hadith of Jibreel ﷺ, which is known in Sunni Islam as the, uh, uh, you know, Ummah Sunnah, it is just like Fatiha. Surah Al-Fatiha is for the Qur'an. And this hadith of Jibreel is the source or the basis or the sum summary of the Sunnah of the Prophet And that, that had Jibreel coming to the Prophet and asking him about Islam, the five pillars. The Prophet tells him about the five pillars, which Jibreel confirmed as correct. He asks him about the six pillars of Iman. Um, and then he asks him about Ihsan and, and excellence or kindness. And that is the depth um, which accompanies the faith the six pillars of faith and the practice, the five pillars of Islam. Th that depth is there when the Prophet says, and um, That you worship God as though you see him, and if you don't see him, then know that he sees you. And all the commentators agree on that, that the Prophet is talking about two different levels here. So he's talking about depth already. So he says, worship God as though you see him. That's his come on to us, every single Muslim actually, to try to worship God as though we see him, so that we are uh, aware of his presence as though we, he's right in front of us and we see him and, and that way it keeps check on our actions. And then he says, but if you don't see him, then know that he sees you. And the commentators say that the first uh, state of maqam or level which he talks about is the higher level of, of the uh, select people of God who do reach that level where they behave as though they're seeing God because they see the names of God and the signs of God wherever they look. So in a sense, they are very aware of the presence of God uh, around them. And if they're not able to reach that state, then the Prophet says, then know that he sees you. Uh, so that is the minimum, again, for the believer to know at least that God is watching us. And again, that um, has a check on one's actions. Uh, Ibn Arabi, uh, typically here, by the way, uh, on the second part of the hadith, he reads it without an extra alif. And he says, فَإِلَّمْ uh, takun." Uh, uh, he takes out the alif from tarahu and that just makes a big difference to the meaning. He's, that would mean then, if you are not, then you will see him, i.e. God. In other words, if you uh, shatter your own ego, you suppress your own ego, you get rid of yourself, uh, then you will be aware only of, of God again. But the other aspect to all of this is in terms of interfaith, uh, religious tolerance, etc., which is, which is really important because it's very easy for all religions to be exclusivist including Islam and, and Muslims. Any book, any scripture, any religion can be read in an exclusivist way, Bible, Torah, uh, etc., New Testament, which is to say that we are the only good people, God only loves us, and everybody else is going to hell, basically. And to be saved, you have to join our club, uh, join our community. And uh, certainly, uh, many Muslims read Islam like that. There is another interpretation, which is very inclusivist, which says that uh, uh, you know, God's mercy is wide and it is open to other people as well. And there are many verses of the Qur'an which say things like the believers and the Jews and the Christians uh, and even the Magians and the polytheists are mentioned in some of those verses uh, which suggests that uh, there is a wider possibility for many of them except the polytheists it says 
you know, if they do good actions, believe in God, do good actions, then they will be saved, uh, basically. Now, again, the meanings of those verses uh, have been discussed for centuries, and there's no agreement over these. But we'll come back to Ibn Arabi. The, another verse of the Quran, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّهِ God decrees that you worship none but Him. The orthodox understanding is that this is a commandment from God. It's not the first commandment. Uh, Thou shalt worship none but God. Ibn Arabi takes it literally again. He says, God has decreed that you worship none but Him. So he says, this actually means that no matter what the human beings do, in the end, they are worshipping God in one form or another. Um, whatever limited view of God they have. He then goes on to say that nobody knows God truly except Himself. Only Allah knows Himself fully. And that's reflected in famous hadith or dua of the Prophet where, where, the, where the Prophet says, uh, Oh God, only you can praise yourself totally. Nobody can uh, exalt or praise about you because nobody knows you except you yourself. And the verses of the Quran which say that also. And so Ibn Arabi says everybody has a limited understanding of God. He calls it the God of created belief. Uh, and everybody in the end um, worships God according to their capacity, according to their limited understanding. And some have deeper and wider than others. And we're all encouraged to follow the path of the Prophet ﷺ and, and of the previous prophets, Jesus Christ, etc., to make that understanding as deep and as, uh, as, as wide as possible. And uh, what's interesting there is that, that uh, with the element of mercy, he opens the door to the fact that other people who are not following the Islamic tradition, but they may well have some understanding of God, you know, which, which may well uh, save them. And that's reflected in kind of the perennialist school, which talks about how all great world religions are, are paths to God. I have some sympathy with that view, but uh, although I do believe in, in principle the way of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the, is, is the best and the most noble and the most best preserved, actually. And the spirituality which flows from the Quran and the Sunnah is, is so amazing. But um, having done interfaith dialogue for a long time with Jews, Christians, Buddhists, Hindus and others, it's clear that other people also have a sense of the sacred and of God and of the divine. And they have uh, different uh, ways of understanding that. And so we, it's we may prefer our own, but um, mm -hmm. uh, other people have, uh, have other ways of looking at things. And what's interesting, again, is that uh, this kind of thinking inspired the Mughals in India for centuries, mm -hmm. who reconciled uh, Islam with even Hinduism. I mean, nowadays we try to have Abrahamic discussions reconciling is, or discussing between Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, where there is more obvious uh, monotheistic Abrahamic overlap. But the, the Mughals in India for centuries um, reconciled Islam and, and Hinduism, for example. And Dara Shikoh had uh, uh, Hindu scriptures translated into uh, Persian and Farsi and Arabic, etc. Now, I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong. I mean, even that was disputed, of course. Other people came along and uh, disputed some of that work, including uh, Sheikh Ahmed Sir Hindi. But what's very interesting is historically, it's a fact that for centuries, um, many Muslims in India felt that uh, the Hindus were a type of Ahlul Kitab. In fact, you know, they went as far as saying that people of scripture, people of the very ancient scripture of the Vedas. And the fact that the Hindu scriptures have prophecies of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in there, apparently, um, would imply that they were true scriptures originally, and then that, the, that even the Hindus were in some sense um, uh, Ahlul Kitab. There, there's one sheikh in, uh, from India who, who said that the Hindus were the people of Nuh Alaihissalam. They were one of the tribes of, of Nuh Alaihissalam, and that's why they had these ancient scriptures, a very, a very ancient religion. Uh, but the, the, the point there is, is that uh, it is possible to have uh, some coexistence based on that. The Muslims in India today are still permeated by this kind of teaching generally. And that's why uh, 150 million Muslims, whatever it is in India now, live amongst uh, Hindus who outnumber them 8 or 9 to 1. But they generally um, think it's okay because they don't see a huge difference in, in mm -hmm. the essential teachings mm -hmm. uh, of those religions. And that's something perhaps Muslims in Pakistan and other places can can learn from? Well, I think you've raised a, a number of fascinating points which I think deserve a, a bit of a, a, a deeper analysis. You talked about um, the universalism uh, of Ibn Arabi, the, the, the trailblazing in terms of interfaith uh, interpretation, which of course in Andalus was very relevant because Spain being what it was, uh, had Christians, Jews and Muslims and the Moorish uh, em empire, if you like, was an example of coexistence for a long, long time, peaceful coexistence actually, and collaboration, cooperation on the European uh, mainland uh, based on Muslim rule though. 
which is another fascinating period for Muslims to focus on. And Arabi, having been in the heart of that kind of civilization in a way, uh, is a great example of what uh, can be achieved by deep thinking Islam or Muslims, um, not only in terms of evolving uh, peaceful um, uh, concepts for coexistence, but also gregarious societies which are well constructed and civilized and uh, way advanced for their time, which, which, al which the Alhambra and various other kind of examples even today from that, that region testify to, like the advance that I guess uh, Muslim thinking uh, was manifesting in practical terms for society as well, was adopted uh, to, to a great extent by the rest of the world. But focusing on this universalism, um, nowadays we, we tend to be, again, veering towards exclusivity, almost like we want that special ticket to paradise and it's something like an exclusive ticket. And in fact, it's not just about excluding people of other faiths, but psychologically we seem to be so uh, competitive and materialistic in the way we even approach our faith that we almost want to beat everybody else to Jannah and it almost created an exclusive patch and it's almost like land acquisition within paradise half the time yeah. I, I kind of I think that people want it's a bit like people buying plots of land on the moon or Mars well in advance it seems wrong to me and where Arabi reminds us of the prophetic way is very clear in this field to me because the way the Prophet, peace be upon him, evolves Islamic uh, rule and society in Medina, particularly the first model society, seems to be more towards this universalist interpretation than the exclusivist one that we often see manifested um, in other parts of the world. Would you, would you agree with, with that in terms of uh, the prophetic manifestation of universalism? It's certainly something Muslims should think very deeply about. Uh, what was the nature of the Prophet's message and life, etc. I mean, I do believe very strongly that the Prophet ﷺ is, is the greatest spiritual figure ever. And God sent him at, at a period in history 14 centuries ago to inject that spirituality into the world. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, uh, Jesus Christ is another great spiritual figure and the Prophet said we're all brothers. And that is six centuries before, Jesus Christ injected that spirituality into the world, if you like. And arguably over the last 2,000 years, Islam and Christianity have been two great civilizing factors around the world. They've had their problems as well, of course, where, where they get things wrong, um, but uh, have civilized large parts of the world and taught about God, etc., to them. Which is why some of the uh, Jewish thinkers in Spain and other places used to say that uh, Islam and Christianity were part of God's plan to bring the teaching of Abraham uh, to most of the world because Judaism didn't spread in the way that uh, Islam and Christianity mm. did. But uh, the idea of coexistence, I think this is where it's very important uh, for the modern world. So you mentioned Andalusia, and you can still go to Spain, Andalusia, and see uh, uh, Muslim areas, you know, uh, Christian churches, Jewish quarters in the great cities of uh, Granada, Cordoba, Sevilla, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, you see that shared heritage everywhere. Again, there were problems. There were occasionally riots against Jews in, in Granada and places like that. But for most of the eight centuries, you know, there was this wonderful civilization which Jews, Muslims, and Christians contributed to. Ibn Arabi himself uh, is buried in Damascus, so um, he traveled from Spain. But again, right across North Africa, if you go to Alexandria, you'll see ancient uh, Christian, Jewish, Greek buildings and Muslim buildings as well, Islamic buildings. You see that in Syria, Palestine, uh, etc. And even coming back to the, the Prophet's Medina, so we find in the Hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari and other Sunni sources, for example, in a Hadith where it says there are groups of Muslims sitting with Jews um, and they're discussing things. They're, they're talking about their faith and the Prophet goes past them and says assalamu alaikum to all of them, for example. There are hadith not so well known, but they're in the tafsir of Tabari and Ibn Kathir about la ikraha fi din, there's no compulsion in religion. Why was that verse revealed? It was revealed because some of the companions of the Ansar in Medina had actually given their children already to Jewish mothers to be suckled and brought up and educated. That's what they used to do because they were polytheists, the Ansar, and they regarded the Jews as having a a pure uh, kind of faith and culture and they would give their children often to the Jews to uh, be brought up. Um, so when the Prophet came, some of the Ansar came to him and said, some of our children are, have been brought up as Jews, they're Jews. Should we force them into Islam? Another companion came to the Prophet and said, two of my sons have become Christians. They went on a trade journey to Syria and they came back as Christians. And uh, this was the answer. It, they wanted to force their children back into Islam and it was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, there is no compulsion in religion. And so there was this kind of tolerance to say, we're living in peace and let people find their way uh, to God. 
And that's something I strongly feel uh, after over a decade of intense uh, interfaith experience is that, uh, you know, I prefer my Islam and the, and the way to God for me through the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alhamdulillah, I've been able to study that for, uh, for decades. Uh, but uh, we listen to our Jewish friends, they're clearly trying to follow the, the way of Moses Alaihissalam, and, and Abraham especially, and they have centuries of learning and teaching around that. We listen to our Christian friends, they're trying to find God through Jesus Christ and following his way in teachings. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, uh, there's a lot of depth there, it's not just very easy, very, it's very lazy and simple for Muslims to say, oh we're right and everybody else is wrong, or you know, all of their scriptures also so, support what we're saying. There needs to be a bit more uh, engagement. So, so, uh, so with, with, with Ibn Arabi and his setting his stall out around this kind of universalism and this kind of broader uh, net of Islam, not just that narrow club almost created exclusively for people who just practice it in a certain way. In a way, he's, he's interpreting Siratul Mustaqim in a slightly different way from the way that perhaps many, uh, many people do. Siratul Mustaqim can be interpreted as uh, the straight path, one straight path. One straight path indicates exclusivity, exclusivity to oneself perhaps, or a club, or a group of people who have an association. Hence a lot of the sectarianism, hence a lot of the kind of that grouping together of, well, we're the ones who are going to get into, into paradise because we're, we're perhaps um, Hanafis or Malikis or Shafis or, or, or whatever s s uh, particular group you ally yourself with or school of thought. Uh, that seems to be rather incompatible with this system of, uh, of viewing Quranic um, Siratul Mustaqim. There is a, a saying or a verse or a hadith, I don't know where I picked this up, but it's, it seems to be quite common. There are as many paths to Allah as there are human souls. I don't know whether you've come across that one, but it seems to be very Arab esque if you like, uh, in terms of the way its, um, its direction is. I think without laboring the universalism issue any further, I'd like to move on to the metaphysics of Arabi and its significance to the modern scientific world, which you've touched on before during our discussion. But I'd like to go at it a little bit more. I mean, and I, I don't really as ascribe to that opinion where one has to find scientific, um, new scientific realizations as a justification for Quran, because science by its nature is an ongoing inquiry and always seems to uh, disprove itself at some stage or other. Um, so using scientific fact, inverted commas, as a way of um, highlighting or, or vind vindicating Quranic verses seems the wrong way to do it. But I do like to look at the Quran and the metaphysics of the Quran, perhaps, and look at human study as it evolves. And one of the latest human endeavors is around uh, quantum physics. It's the most kind of exciting area, cosmology, quantum physics, um, and, and relate it to the metaphysics. Because I found an interesting fact that um, uh, the guys at CERN, who you know, are doing a lot of the latest research around quantum physics and speeds of light and testing things, uh, on, on that sort of sub-molecular level as well as um, on, on the, the macro uh, level. And they seem to uh, even have run out of ideas at times. And most recently, they actually invited a whole group of in, uh, in, uh, faith, people from faith, uh, to come and discuss their metaphysics and around the, uh, the issues of quantum physics. So. Does metaphysics still have a place in modern society, do you think? As, uh, does this indicate that there's still a huge, huge area of research that we ought to be doing around the metaphysics of Arabi? Yeah, it's probably worth um, just reminding ourselves and, and the audience what the word metaf metaphysics means. So physics covers um, the way things operate in the ordinary way that we see them. So, you know, uh, anything that moves or, or touches or... or, or uh, or hit something else. That's all covered by physics, from the stars and galaxies through to uh, cars and machines and aeroplanes and uh, you know everything we do. I mean, we are sitting on our chairs because of the law of gravity. That's part of physics. Metaphysics means beyond physics. So what's beyond that? In other words, uh, what we would call in in Islam or 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 what's to do with the spiritual world or or, or the divine world. What's what's beyond what we can see, or test, or touch, or feel, etc. And and in the end. 
you know, we, we can't be sure about those things. Um, we are dependent on revelation for that. And, the, and of course, our rationalist friends, atheist friends, will, will argue, well, you know, how can you trust ancient books which you can't test by your own admission? Because you're saying all well, that we can test and experiment with is physical, it's scientific. So that's all we have. And, and you cannot go beyond that and make any claims uh, beyond that. And that's why they say you can't talk about God if you're a scientist and you can't believe in God, etc. And one of my answers to that is the, the revelation is so consistent. You see, if, if it was just a lot of fairy tales, which didn't make any sense, but the, when you go especially deeper into the meaning of the Quran and Hadith, you, you see so much consistency there that uh, you have a choice either to just dismiss it all or to say, no, there's something in there. In fact, there's a lot in there uh, about the names of God, etc. But coming back to quantum physics, etc., uh, CERN, um, what goes on at the subatomic level is really mysterious. You just read any book on, on quantum physics. So, for example, uh, we know where everything sits. We think we know where everything think, uh, sits. But when you go down to the smallest atom and beyond the subatomic level, we find that we can't know where something is and where it's going at the same time. Things are not in precise places. I mean, this little clip here, we know it's exactly here where it is. We know where our shoes, our chairs are. At the tiny level within our bodies and all around the world, um, in the universe, we can't actually say where anything is with any kind of precision. It's also uh, hazy, for example. But very funny things happen in quantum physics and relativity. Uh, Einstein's theory says matter turned into energy. Space and time are the same thing. You call it space-time. If you go at close to the speed of light, your mass increases, the space shortens, time slows down. All kinds of funny things happen. Um, so and isn't, isn't this so a lot of mystery there? Well, well the, this mystery is what I was kind of uh, driving at because uh, of course, Arabi speaks of teleportation mm. and traveling through perhaps time even. Because when we talk about uh, Miraj, for instance, and, and Arabi dwells on this in, in, in some of his books, and he's very fascinated by Miraj and, and the mm. Prophet's night journey, but which seems to defy yes. all you know, physics, if you like. And this, this relationship between the world of the unseen, or what we don't know, uh, meeting the world which we can see is an area where obviously there's a rich discourse to be had uh, over, uh, over, the, over the, the coming centuries. As technology advances, it, one would argue that actually even more of those mysteries may be, uh, may be, uh, may be unveiled, but none of them contradicting those things which mystics or metaphysicians have already uh, talked about or experienced, or even, you know, um, uh, discussed. Yeah, I, th I, I must admit that's one of the areas where I have a problem with some of Ibn Arabi's writing. I, I simply don't understand when he talks about a person who went went for a bathe in a river and ended up in a in another country in another century and lived his life there and then came back. You know, so the, the man was living two parallel lives at the same time. Mm -hmm. I I just do not understand that. So I, I just you know kind of ignore that. Uh, for the time being, but uh, what I do know, the mystics have these insights into uh, which sometimes the scientists come to independently, but much later. So, for example, Michio Kaku, the great physicist, mm. wrote a book called Hyperspace. At the end of that book, he says um, perhaps the whole reason for humanity evolving or appearing on Earth was to look back at the beginning of the universe and to look through our telescopes, you know, 13 billion mm. years back. Perhaps that's why we are here in the end is to describe and see the whole of the universe. Now that's very similar to the mystical idea that we are here to know God. Um, to witness. And, and to witness, yeah, and to worship God. And, and there's other examples like that, which show that sometimes scientists come up with things they think are uh, insights through the science, and the mystics have got that before. But I'll come back to something I mentioned in the last program, which was about the names of God uh, being reflected in the laws of science. Now if you look at the law of gravity, and um, not only does it uh, cover you know, apples falling off trees, but uh, it covers the planets um, and the stars and galaxies rotating around in the heavens. We've measured that to uh, enormous levels of precision. And uh, the theory of gravity, Newton's theory, updated by Einstein, general relativity, is very, very precise. And it, and it covers all of this. It's an incredibly beautiful theory. Quantum physics is similar. The laws of chemistry and biology, etc., uh, in the evolution of the natural world also. So. For a believer and somebody who's brought up in the kind of the, that mystical tradition, uh, I am driven towards the idea that the names of beauty in Allah Jamilun and also of Al Qadr, precision, determination, measurement, that these are reflected in the laws of science and in nature.
which is something very beautiful and, and, and very wonderful. Now, if you accept that as sacred, therefore science is sacred, technology is sacred, I, I think the practical fruit of it, which I hope what the mystics gain to discern to the scientists would try to teach us, is that we can't treat science and technology as something neutral to do what we like with. There are strong ethical implications of what we do. So I mentioned weapons of mass destruction is a, is a major example. You know, nuclear physics was used to build a nuclear bomb, which is a very destructive force and, and killed uh, hundreds of thousands of Japanese in, uh, in a split second, you know, last century, lest we forget. We have chemical weapons, biological weapons, which are horrible things. Uh, on the other hand, we also have now the technology to clone human beings. You know, we have the first three-parent baby research being legalized in this country where you can take the DNA of mom and dad and take the DNA of a third person to repair the uh, damaged DNA of mom or dad, which may give the child, or is very likely to give the child serious diseases, and you replace that with healthy DNA from a third person so that the child is healthy, but you literally have a child with three parents because they have the DNA from three different people. Mm -hmm. uh, the technology exists to clone human beings, like I said, you know, uh, goats and sheep and cows and all kinds of animals and plants, uh, thousands of them now have been cloned. Uh, the only reason it hasn't been done with humans is because of the law against it. And interestingly, there is one alim, Ayatollah Tashkhiri, uh, who sees no objection, actually, to cloning human beings even, uh, w with strict conditions, but he sees no fundamental reason not to. The ethical questions are some of the most difficult ones, mm -hmm. and that's why we need people to um, reflect on, on the inner aspects of what, what does the world mean? What do the names of God in the world mean? What implications does that have? How do we, how do we use our science and technology? because we can... Uh, well, it's a fantastic point to finish on. We can engineer things, yeah. Because I think that's possibly the subject for our next uh, discussion, uh, Islam and science, and perhaps still continuing with metaphysics and its implication, but the ethical question comes in. But thank you for giving us a, a, very, uh, a very concise kind of uh, uh, summary of Ibn Arabi yet again, and extending that uh, to the world of science this time in terms of its practical relevance to the modern age. Thank you for, for watching this particular edition. We look forward to seeing you in the next edition. Assalamu alaikum, khudafiz.